Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation. Hi, I'm Colin Laveau. And I'm Angela Hagenbach. Welcome to Arts Upload. This week, we take a look at the Kansas City Costume Company. No costumes yet, but we have great stories about everything from the Kronos Quartet to a writer of crime fiction and another favorite fountain. Plus, a haunting how-to. It's all ahead on The Upload. Synergy. I think that's the term they use when different forces swirl together to create something really special. And that's a good word to describe what happened recently at Hillsburg Hall at the Kauffman Stadium. The world-renowned Kronos Quartet recently played a brand new composition commemorating a sad centennial, the start of World War I. The dramatic multimedia piece was co-commissioned by the Harlemund Jewel series and the National World War I Museum. Here's an inside look at some of the day's activities and a little glimpse into how art can help us understand both past and present. When I started Kronos in 1973, I hoped we would last a week. And then after the first week, I was, wow, maybe we can last a month. Basically, these last 40 years, I've been doing exactly what I've wanted to do since I was 12 years old. Throughout those four decades, the Kronos Quartet has stayed consistently busy and always at the forefront of the place where classical music intersects with artists of all different kinds. More and more, David says, commissioned works like Beyond Zero are playing an important role in the group's artistic life. When an organization believes in the possibility of something really important happening and they actually support that, it makes us realize how much there is that can be done in music. So just hours before the third public performance of Beyond Zero, synced to filmmaker Bill Morrison's evocative images, the violinist did as thousands do every year and stepped back in time at the National World War I Museum. Walking through the museum on one side is terribly disturbing and on the other side it's astonishing. Seeing grenades and bombs and, and that airplane that it looks like if you took your garden hose to it, it would fall out of the sky. World War I began as a war, kind of the 19th century, and it's a 19th century philosophy going up against 20th century technology. We collected our first piece in 1920, and we have the most globally diverse collection of World War I artifacts. It was a world war, and I've never seen that as clearly exhibited before in any book or anywhere. Musical threads, which echo that global participation, have been woven throughout Alexandra Vrebolov's composition. A Bosnian, she's all too familiar with the specter of death and destruction. Alexandra is the only composer that has ever written for Kronos who actually has experienced her city being bombed while she was writing music for us. I remember calling her and hearing bombing going on in the background. The opportunity to participate in artistic creation and have a role in that is really exciting, particularly because it relates to the collective memory we have about World War I here in Kansas City. The other essential part of this equation is the series called Harriman Jewel. Named for the English professor who founded it, 
and the College in Liberty, which has continued to sustain it since Richard's death in 2010. Clark Morris calls him his mentor. He was doing this not just for the college and for students and faculty, but for the larger community. And he wanted to be uh, Kansas City's premier presenter of, of these works. Richard's often thought for his you know, exquisite taste, the very best in classical music and classical dance. But he also had some things that were more cutting edge and new music and the combination of multiple art forms. I think uh, Richard would love this. Nearly 90 years ago, you've got this massive public support, this grassroots effort to build the space. It just seems only natural that Kansas City again is leading the commemorations of the First World War. Kansas City audiences will get a lot more than just one night at the Kaufman Center. Michael Stern and the Symphony, the Lyric Opera, the Friends of Chamber Music, and even the Nelson Atkins Museum have made the Great War a part of their upcoming programming plans. People think about history and military and you know, maybe it changes the map, but when you talk to artists, they recognize that it changes music and dance and the visual arts in profound ways. The impact of armed conflict has been on David Garrison's mind a lot lately. Along with Beyond Zero, he's developing an opera about the war in Vietnam and the 150 years since America's Civil War. I started Kronos in order to play Black Angels by George Crum, which was written in 1970. I asked him if, as we call it, the Vietnam War influenced his music. What he said was, there were strange things in the air. Musicians, we're like antennae, and we absorb, interpret, and explore those strange things in the air, and there's certainly plenty of them right now. When it comes to self-publishing, we can't all be Fifty Shades of Grey, but the rules about how writers can reach readers are definitely changing. And for one Kansas City writer, at least, that has been a very good thing. Joel Goldman is an attorney who also writes crime thrillers. And one of his protagonists is an FBI agent, Jack Davis, a man who fights for good, sometimes in the vicinities of backdrops you might even recognize. Producer Ann Copeland Davis is on the case. I'm a big believer that the characters don't exist in a vacuum. Place should inform the story. I try to bring that alive. That's the apartment complex where Jack Davis's daughter Wendy lives. And it's just on the east side of uh, the Country Club Plaza. Everybody in Kansas City knows it's sort of the, sort of the crown jewel. And uh, she lived right on the edge of that. Well, the specificity with which you wrote about it made me think it was a place that you've looked at before. Well, you know, it's right next to a Winstead's hamburger joint. <laughs> And I've been in that I've been in that Winstead's enough time to pay attention to what was around it. A lot of writing is about paying attention and noticing noticing the detail and just familiarity. We're in Argentine, which is now part of Kansas City, Kansas. It was founded by miners and meat packers and railroad workers, and they built a community from the ground up that's noisy, gritty, rough, and powerful. Very tough to resist that kind of, that kind of force. And I think to myself, how can I, how can I use that? Look, we live in a dangerous world. 
you know, whether it's a uh, school shooting or Ebola, and people want to escape from that. Crime fiction is a great escape for people because they can confront in a vicarious way all of those terrible things, but it's safe and they know at the end that there's going to be accountability. These days, Goldman is much happier writing about justice than practicing it. For three decades, he worked as a litigator for what was then Hush and Eppenberger, deciphering fact from fiction, not unlike FBI agent Jack Davis, the central character in his crime thriller, Shakedown. Both are detail people, masters of control. Every case had bad facts, every case had good facts. Sometimes the law was on your side, sometimes it wasn't, sometimes it was ambiguous. All of those things happen in a crime novel. Give the reader reasons to doubt or believe or accept, and then at the end, unlike in the courtroom if you've done your homework, there's gotta be a twist. I'm told that at one point, the then district attorney in Wyandotte County took the county surveyor leading the expedition down there. They thought there might be a murder victim's body. Inside this utility building, there is a trap door and there is a shaft with a ladder built into the side of the shaft that will take you down into this underground uh, cave and the lake that plays such a big role in, in, in shakedown. Jack's whole world has shifted. The ground under his feet is no longer stable, but it's not the ground that's unstable, it's he's unstable. And there's no better place to explore that than by plunging underground, where he has to confront not only the bad guy, but also who's gonna win between him and the movement disorder. I couldn't write that above ground. That scene couldn't be above ground. Joel Goldman and Jack Davis also share something else a movement disorder called tics. Similar to Tourette's, it rarely occurs after adolescence, but Goldman was diagnosed at 52. It's hard to explain what it's like to have your life turned so upside down. We all wanna be in control of our lives. If you can't control your body, it's really an assault on your bedrock sense of stability and identity. And that was the transition that I was going through. Uh, and I really wanted to explore that through Jack's eyes, let him say the things that I was thinking and feeling. Though Tix is not life-threatening, Goldman did retire his law practice in 2006. The arrival soon after of Amazon's Kindle began to dramatically change the publishing landscape. For established authors like Goldman, who had yet to hit the bestseller list, self-publishing offered an exciting new option with greater economic and creative control over their work. My publisher, in the 10 years that they handled eight of my titles, sold cumulatively probably around 120,000 copies of my books. In the little over three years that I've been self-publishing those same titles, plus two other titles that I wrote, I've sold over 400,000 copies. And Amazon gave authors like me a, a second chance, a second life. It has allowed many self-published authors to make a nice living. All right, girls, in your kennel. Let's go. Goldman works out of his home office in Leewood, shared with his dogs Roxy and Ruby. They also appear in his novels. While his wife, Hildy, often takes the wheel, Joel refuses to slow down, launching a new venture called Brash Books, an online home for other crime writers. Crime fiction really gives you the opportunity to explore the human condition, our frailties, our strengths, how they interact. It's great fun as an author to, to delve into that, to explore that, to put people in difficult or impossible situations and see what they're going to do. Because I often don't find out until they're in that position. I might be sitting at the keyboard and all of a sudden I say, boy, that's pretty cool. And it's those moments of those, those creative epiphanies 
that are the most enjoyable moments uh, of riding. Where am I? Well, it could be almost anywhere around the Show Me State. Join us this fall as KMOS presents Missouri Life as we spark your spirit of discovery about your hometown as we travel the state and show you all around your Missouri. That's coming up this fall right here on KMOS. We go now from one rider to another in this week's edition of My Favorite Fountain. Producer Dave Burkhart found a man who's seen waterworks in cities all over the world. The Kansas City Stars, Charles Guswell. It's wonderful to be here on an autumn morning at Meyer Circle, a beautiful piece of architecture and motion that uh, I think is, is a beautiful spot to begin any day. What inspires me about this fountain is the, the beauty of the sculpture that is the centerpiece of the fountain. Just the, the incredible grace with which it sends that beautiful blue Royals baseball club celebrating spray uh, arcing out there. I, it's just, it's just a lovely thing. I used to walk my Britneys uh, up, up the parkway and around here. My old Brittany, Rufus, uh, loved to jump in it. In the winter, uh, sometimes if, if, if the real cold comes and catches it when it's still running, it makes some beautiful uh, ice statuary. <laughs> a couple of blocks down this way, uh, in the median of the parkway, uh, there's a little decorative pool that uh, a pair of Canada geese every spring dependably come there to nest and to raise their goslings. But for me and for our family, it was a wonderful place to teach my daughters how to fish. There are no fish in that little pool at all, but uh, it, it was a grand place to teach them the use of a casting rod and a reel. And so that, that was, from the time we moved into this neighborhood, this has been a part of our lives. You're watching Arts Upload. Our next story involves dressing for effect. Ever heard of the term screamsters? That's what they call the dedicated folks who do the Halloween haunting at Worlds of Fun every year. We were granted special access to their lair. Character's name is Bravehorn, Bravehorn the Hobgoblin. I work, I've been working here at Worlds of Fun since uh, 2007 as a uh, street character. Yeah, for the most part, mask, just when the mask goes on, it makes it easy because most of it's already painted. Can I look down? Yeah, there's only like 25 makeup artists here in the makeup trailer, 25 to 30, and there's like almost 500 screamsters. So we've been working since 2 o'clock. And we're supposed to all get done by 6.30. So there's tiny little freckles on the mask, so I always try to bring those tiny freckles onto Mark's skin. So that way it looks like it's cohesive, it belongs to him. And then now Mark just has to go and get dressed and he'll be ready. So. Oh yeah see people run screaming from you is kind of a different experience than having people real friendly to you. People that know me in real life, I am a gentle giant. But when I'm out here, I'm, everybody sees me and they're like, oh, don't want to go near him. Uh, I can read the, people, the fear in people's eyes because you can see that look. It's kind of a rush. My other life, I work for the military. I'm in the Air National Guard working out at Whiteman Air Force Base. Actually, a lot of my military training came into that because I like to do the statue. Um, people see me standing there, they don't know I'm real. I've had big guys my size or bigger take their little girlfriends, put them in between th them and me, screaming. 
I have a set of skulls I stand out on out in the park. Well, I hop down off that. It's coming off a three-foot skull down to the ground right in front of them, and they're <laughs> they don't know what to do. To me, haunt is a uh, place where you can kind of get that fear into you. And for our final story tonight, we head to Sedalia to take a look at an art museum that has some very unique abstract art and sculptures. That's right. The Dom Museum is located on the State Fair Community College campus in Sedalia, Missouri. We got the chance to talk with one of the curators of the museum and we're given a little more insight on the museum's art pieces. I think we're the only contemporary visual arts museum between St. Louis and Kansas City, um, situated in mid-Missouri. Uh, we're a contemporary art museum. We collect artwork made since the late 1960s, primarily American, but not just American. We have an international collection. We collect in most media that um, contemporary artists use, and we have um, permanent collection, temporary exhibitions, and education programs. The Dom is not that old. It uh, opened the doors in February 2002. Um, it's the result of a single individual, Dr. Harold F. Dom, who was an art collector and a radiologist whose career was centered in Sedalia. And at a certain point, his collection grew too big for his home, and he decided that he'd like to make it public. So um, friends and the community and the college got together and they decided to raise money to build this museum, to house his collection um, and to make sure that it, in it increased and to make it an educational facility on this campus but also a really strong cultural um, component of the community as well. Dr. Dom's original collection it encompassed about 200 artworks, and there was a certain character to them that we continue to honor. So that's really the, the nucleus of the museum, not just the permanent collection, but it's sort of the museum's conscience. It informs um, our decisions for exhibitions. It informs our decisions for what else we'll show at the museum. So it all goes back to those original 200 or 250 pieces that Dr. Dom collected. So that helped set the stage for us to collect primarily abstract painting, to collect large-scale sculptural ceramics, to collect in the area of prints and graphics. Those are the three main collecting areas for the museum. In terms of exhibitions, we are trying to fill in gaps in the collection. We try to expand on certain ideas that are, collect that are uh, contained in those original artworks. Um, so one of the other things that is important for the museum is to represent the state and the community in which we live. So we collect, we have a strong collection of works by um, Missouri artists as well as artists in the general Midwestern region. Well, we're open to the public six days a week um, and free and open to the public. We're open uh, Tuesday through Friday from 11 until 5, and then on Saturday and Sunday we're open from 1 until 5, only closed on Monday. Um, you know, you, if you're not sure about our hours or when we're here, you can check our website at um, www.dommuseum.org. And we also have a Facebook page, so that will keep you up to date on what's here, um, what's going on, when we're open, when we're closed. But we invite everyone to come by. We have visitorship from um, all over Missouri and from the, all over the country. And we get about 12,000 people a year coming through. have an exhibition rotation that happens about three times a year. Uh, 
there's one that is in the summer, usually June, and then we change exhibitions again in very early October, and then again in early February. Um, and during each of those rotations, we can have upwards of three or four exhibitions that will be on view during that time. So if you've come and you think you know us, um, just wait a while and you'll have a, a brand new experience. Hello everyone, my name is Josh Leonard, host of a new show called Upstart Film, where I sit down with independent filmmakers, actors, and everyone in the indep independent industry from Kansas City to Columbia and even to Warrensburg as I talk to them about their hardships and processes when it comes to making independent film. You definitely don't want to miss this new exciting show, Upstart Film, for your Thursday, only on KMOS TV. And that's it for another week's worth of Arts Upload. We hope you enjoyed it. We had a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Lots of fun stuff to spend some time with on the web at KMOS.org. From Columbia, I'm Angela Hagenbach. I'm Colin Laveau. Thanks for watching. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by the Francis Family Foundation and the Courtney S. Turner Foundation.